Well, um, while it's getting set up, um, just a, a little bit of background about me. Uh, I spent 30 years in the United States until about two years ago. I am a US citizen, I'm an Australian citizen, and proud to be both. Um, I have children who I raised in the United States. They were born in Ames, Iowa. I was at Iowa State University as a professor of statistics for about 15 years and then moved to Columbus, Ohio and um, continued as professor of statistics at uh, the Ohio State University. I've now, um, in the last two years, uh, moved to the University of Wollongong. Uh, Wollongong is a wonderful community um, about 80 kilometres south of Sydney. Uh, it is some of the most spectacular coastline that you would ever see. Uh, it's a very beautiful area. Um, we'll see a bit of Wollongong uh, a little bit later. Uh, and uh, I, I just want to say I'm, I'm very happy to be here speaking to you. I come to the US quite often. I've retained projects in the United States, particularly um, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is in Pasadena, just down the road. Uh, if any of you have come on that route today, uh, you'll know that it's about 60 miles away and not always the quickest trip. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, you do what you do. Um, I want to pay particular um, attention to my uh, collaboration at NASA. I'm a distinguished visiting scientist uh, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and call out uh, Tim Stow, who has uh, been a real pivotal person in helping me with the slides and some of the images that I'm going to show you towards the end of the talk. Tim is in the audience here and I'm very happy to, uh, to mention that uh, collaboration. So some of these slides might look familiar and what I plan to do is take you on a, on a tour around, in and around statistics as it was practiced and how we're practicing it now and look at the, some of the cultural inferences, influences because I think you need to share some of my shoes in order to appreciate where I'm going to go with this. But I'm going to be in your shoes for the moment uh, and just put up the six questions of geodesign and now take you into another world uh, of statistical design. Um, in this world, uh, we use design much as Carl Steinitz talks about in his book, as a verb, as a noun, as an adjective. Um, and the question often re revolves around what does that word mean? And it means many things to many people. And my, my goal here is to tell you what it means within the statistics community and to look at it, if you like, how it can be expanded into what it means in the geo-design or, or geography community. Um, I've quoted Humpty Dumpty, it's actually Lewis Carroll uh, from Alice in Wonderland, of course. So the guy who really got us going into design and really into statistical inference in general is R.A. Fisher. He was a pretty crusty guy. Um, he was born in 1890. Uh, he passed away in Adelaide, Australia, actually. Um, and in 1962, an enormously productive man and uh, is known within the genetics community as their hero and is known within the statistics community as, you know, the father of statistics, you might say. What I'd like to do is, is really wrap Fisher's work around a more modern movement that actually sort of draws from uh, a man by the name of Thomas Bayes and to try to look at sort of the best of, of what both Fisher and Bayes had to offer. It's our culture in statistics. I'd like to share some of it with you and to know um, and to use it to get to my final goal, which is geodesign with a statistical or uncertain flavor to it. So Fisher um, is extremely well known um, within the design community and, and for us in statistics, design is all about finding causation. Uh, causation in the presence of uncertainty. Uh, and Fisher um, <clears throat> made some nice, um, looked at three criteria for good design and that was blocking, which from a spatial point of view controls large scale or coarse variation. Uh, 
had something really quite um, revolutionary at the time, which was to introduce randomization. Um, and that was to capture the small scale variation or the fine scale. And then something we would always all, all like, but sometimes don't have the luxury of having is replication, which means more information, but a cost comes associated with it. So here's a picture of a field. Um, I know it isn't uh, sort of fancy satellites flying over the Earth, but largely speaking, Fisher's work has allowed the world, the Earth, to feed itself, and it should not be underrated. It has also allowed the pharmaceutical community to come up with wonder drugs, to test them, to make sure that there are no deleterious side effects, and the, all that theory of experimental design goes into the medication that you might take every day. And when you go to the drugstore and feel that you're going to buy something that is not going to poison you, um, it really comes from these notions of experimental design. So I don't, while it, I've purposely chosen a black and white picture to indicate the sort of field trials that were being undertaken in the 30s, it really reaches forward into your everyday life right now. And what's common to all of this is that when you plant a field of wheat, you have no idea what your yield is going to be. And what you would like to do is to compare different varieties of wheat or rice uh, or corn and come up with a variety which grows the best, um, which has the most productivity for the least cost. And that's the sort of work that Fisher really uh, enabled. That was his gift to the world, one of his gifts to the world. Now, I've written up something a little uh, wonky here, of course. Um, where are we? Uh, I don't seem to have a... Well, maybe it's here. I would like to have a, um, a pointer. And this... Yeah, it doesn't seem... Thank you. All right. I rehearsed yesterday. It looks like this is a little different from yesterday. Thank you very much. So the, the slightly wonky thing is that, well, uh, we don't just see the yield. Of course, we see the effect of a plot as well. And um, what we need to do is somehow or other try to group, try to have experiments that we can group into blocks. Some people call this homogeneity. Uh, in other words, all the plots seem to have the same fertility within a block. We would like to do that, and the notion of blocking comes out, which means, you know, I'm going to control the trend or the mean or the large-scale variability from another point of view. So just to introduce the notion of blocks. Now, the notion of randomization comes because even if you do that, even if you put certain applications of treatments in similar fertility trials and then simply replicate them, if you happen to put treatments in the most fertile areas, you will see a better, a better yield for that particular variety, even though it's purely because you happen to be in a highly fertile area. So this sort of idea uh, that Fisher had was quite brilliant, really. It was to randomize the assignment of treatments to different blocks so that on average, if you like, uh, you aren't preferentially choosing a particular treatment with a particular block. Now, in the pharmaceutical experiment uh, that, that are done, that's called a double-blind trial. That's when the doctor has really no idea which drug he or she is giving to a patient. There's a tendency to want your drug to do better, so you might inadvertently choose a more healthy patient to take your drug. And so these double-bind trials are extremely important, and they really come from Fisher's work early on, knowing that the plots, in the case of pharmacy, uh, those plots are individuals, uh, that those plots actually need to be randomised. There is a caution here I'd like to mention that, particularly in more modern data sets, where you don't have the luxury of doing a lot of experiments, 
nor of replication. And I'll talk about how you might get around that in a bit. That you're faced with observational studies and those observational studies simply come at you and you don't have the luxury of randomization. But there are ways to introduce randomization even into observational studies and it has to do with choosing sites that you might actually want to look at salmon, for example, uh, the salmon run in the northwest. Um, it's a tendency to choose really nice sites, uh, but if you randomise choice of sites, then even your observational studies will not be subject to this inadvertent choice and coming up with conclusions that are not scientifically tenable. Um, this is a picture of the sort of thing that could happen. Um, on the vertical axis, we have a plot effect, and here I've put the plot number. And if for some reason or other, and this is a pure plot effect, there aren't any treatments imposed. For some reason or other, I choose the worst treatment, uh, the worst variety, and I happen to hit it on this plot number one. And I might conclude that that's the wheat that we should grow for 100,000 people to feed a country, shall we say. I run a real risk of actually putting it on a place where the plot effect, in other words, the fertility was high, but the treatment is really not quite what it should be. So in this case, I chose obviously to put A, B, C, and D here on one, two, three, and four, and even if treatment A is the worst, I'll end up with uh, a bad result. So the idea now is to sign these treatments randomly and to do it a lot. And that was Fisher's brilliant approach to this. It's to replicate with another randomization. And what you see in this particular picture of the field trial is precisely that. Here's the first replication. They're in a block. They have similar fertility. I go to the next replication. It's in another block with similar fertility. The order of the treatments is randomized. And you can see how Fisher was able to deal with these plot effects over which he felt he had no control. So I'm a spatial statistician, that's my area. Uh, I've written a couple of books in it. And um, some recent research which I did, surprisingly, uh, there is still something sort of in these rather older studies that Fisher did, that spatial depend, oh, excuse me, uh, I need to go back. that spatial dependence could weaken the benefit of replication, but if you do spatial modelling, you can get some of that benefit back. The point about this slide really is more about replication, that if, if in the case that I showed you, I think there were five blocks, that means I have five replicates of every treatment. Someone might say, that's not enough. I need 10 times that much, or 100 times that much. The benefit that you get from that is only square root of that number. Um, and it's simply because the standard errors are the square root of the number of replicates. So if, for example, you want to decrease your standard errors, your error bars, you might say, um, by a factor of a half, and each replication costs $1,000, you'll need $4,000 to do that. So that uh, is a little sobering. Um, I think we need to, when we do statistics, we need to be very careful about replication and its cost. And just remember that, you know, no, there's no free lunch. And in fact, this free lunch or this lack of free lunch comes in the order of the square of the precision. It costs $4,000 to get half uh, the error bars by a factor of a half. Um, so the model that Fisher uses involves the treatment effect plus the plot effect. And then there's data on top of this. Now I'm taking you through this story for a reason. And I want you to remember why. Y is what you don't see. Z is what you do see. And there's measurement error associated with that. In the, in the, um, in the wheat experiment, that would be simply when going to harvest, you leave shafts of wheat on the ground or you're not measuring properly uh, when, you, when you come to measure the yield. So this measurement error component is extremely important and it differentiates between Y and Z. 
If you want to think about it in this way, uh, Z is what you see, Y is what you would like to see. And on occasions, you don't, well, first of all, there's measurement error components in there, so what you would like to see is a smoother version of what you do see, and you have to worry about that. If you've heard the word filtering, uh, in the engineering literature, that's what filtering does. It gets rid of the measurement error. But worse than that in spatial statistics, sometimes we don't even see anything at a particular location. And yet, we still have to come up with a why. And I like to call that missingness. So we have noise, which would be the measurement error, and missingness, which is not present on this slide, which involves things that you don't get to see, but you would have liked to have seen. Both contribute to our inference, our lack of knowledge, and I'm going to make the case in a moment that probability theory is the way to handle this type of uncertainty. All right, so this is a little sobering. Um, I don't have a 10% or a 1%, but if you read that slide, you wonder why you get out of bed in the morning. Our world is uncertain. To explain the world, we need science, but our attempts are uncertain. In other words, our scientific models are only that. The data which we take to explain our uncertain world are uncertain also. So, stay with me. I, have, I, I am your saviour. I have statistics. I have statistics with a capital S. I don't mean baseball statistics. I don't mean basketball statistics. I don't mean the sorts of summary statistics that we're all used to, but we have a science. And our science is statistics, and it's the science of uncertainty. We rely strongly on a branch of mathematics known as probability theory, but we need to know about probability theory in order to do statistics with a capital S. And that's what I'm really here to talk to you about now. So uh, if you'll bear with me a little bit, um, PR, capital P, small r, per, is, means probability. And I think most of you have seen that. And remember I made a real distinction between the Y that we don't see but we would like to see and the Z, which are these imperfect, noisy observations. And what Fisher did, and I'll, I'll make the case in a moment in a very wonky slide, but what Fisher did is he concentrated on Z and he did not worry about Y. And what we're seeing now as a revolution in statistics, and I do mean, I am not exaggerating, this way of thinking is huge, which is to split up the presence of what you see and what you don't see into conditional probabilities. It's remarkably powerful if you've heard of network analysis or Bayes networks, this is what's behind all of this type of analysis. Conditional probabilities. We no longer think simply as a probability, a coin toss, a half, or the probability of somebody on a free throw throwing the basketball through the basket. We don't think of those things. We condition on things. It might be whether the person throwing that basketball is on a home court or is on the road. And we know there's a difference. So just, if you just keep thinking conditionally, um, we'll make progress here. So in the hierarchical setting, we think of this conditional probability of what we see, given what we'd like to see, or given the unknown, as Z given Y. And then underlying that is the process model Y. And that's where science is. That's where the geography is. This Z is the imperfect lens through which we're watching that perfect world. Now, having said that, why have I got a probability on my perfect world? Well, because, we'll just go back here, because our attempts to explain the world, science, are uncertain. In the physics community, they have a lot of certainty. In economics, not so much. In social sciences, quite a bit less. And so you can imagine uh, where you sit. You are more or less certain about what you think is happening in the world. 
And the probability theory that we have is, an, is a way to capture that. So that's where it is. Don't get confused with the influence of Z here. Z is separate. If, if I know what my, how my instrument is performing, and when you use an instrument, it might be something very technical like a GPS, it might be something rather untechnical like a survey. But a good survey methodologist will tell you what the errors are in his or her survey and what they're telling you is this probability. Not the probability of Z, but the probability of Z given Y. And I'll say why in a moment that is so important. So the Reverend Thomas Bayes, um, I think two or three hundred years ago, um, a paper was published posthumously where he actually he wrote down Bayes' rule, sometimes called Bayes' theorem. And what it allows us to do is to go from those two probabilities, Z given Y and Y, and come up with the things that we don't know but would like to know, which is why, the underlying process, the underlying geography, the economics, the biology, the physics, whatever it is that goes in there. And it could be a combination of all three or four. So if you think you would like to know what the economics, what the influence of a poor economy is on the environment, then one could build that into why. And if you have theories of that, but uncertain theories, they could be built into the probability, sorry, the probability of why. And then based on what you see, what you know, you can make inference on what you don't know. And it's this probability that's extremely important. For those of you who are wondering about this thing on the bottom, this thing on the bottom is simply got by integrating over the thing on the top. It makes probabilities add to one. It's a very important property. All right, this is the wonky slide that really points out that Fisher really uh, did not put in Y in his particular formulation of the problem. Where did Y and go in Fisher's models? They're sitting in the plot effect, and that's really for any colleagues in the audience who were wondering, but we can go on. So <laughs> space, that's for me, in a way. <laughs> so spatial statistics really helps in this model for Y. And I want to make a case for it. And I'll admit that this is a very um, kind of basic slide. And I've put spatial statistics there in the intersection between geography and statistics. I've been privileged to be invited to a number of um, GIS conferences. And in particular, uh, a number of years ago, when the NCGIA was going in various forms of that. Uh, I was very privileged to be involved in that. And they wanted me there because I was a spatial guy. Um, coming from the statistics community. So let's concentrate on, and I know that there are many other parts like urban planning and various things that go into this, but let's just give me um, the, the, the notion of drawing a big circle and calling it geography, and I see geodesign here. But I don't see it really moving into the statistics community, and that's where I'd like to go. And that's where, in the last couple of days, in discussion with Carl Steinitz, we've been talking around these areas, and my talk today is an attempt to get us there, at least to get us thinking about how we could get there. So back to um, a little bit, uh, and then we'll move on to some sort of more like 2000 and, well, 2020s, really. Um, these plot effects are spatially related. And I want to close off the story. Fisher was not using spatial statistics. He tried to deal with it with randomization. And the more recent research I've shown is that you can actually have your cake and eat it. So this uh, represents a particular um, model. It's sometimes called the exponential model in spatial statistics. There's the exponent. And that particular model can get you back much more efficiency. In other words, more bang for your buck. Or in other words, remember I talked about the error bars being decreased by a square root order of square root 1 over n. Uh, it's the order of magnitude that I can improve here. It's still 1 over square root n, but I can improve it using spatial statistics. OK, so. Um, tried to bring you up to speed on 
on what we think about in, when we, we're trained in statistics and where we come from when it comes to design. We think of blocking, we think of randomization, we think of replication, and then we follow it up with statistical inference with a capital S. But let's get back to the really important issues about science. And I don't want to dwell too much uh, on the how question because I want to really think about the why question. And the why question, to me, is always predicated by the where question and the when question, and I think I'm, I'm in good company here. I think you'll give me at least that. The uncertainty, though, shows up in, in rather important ways, and I continue to make this distinction between the Z, which I see, and the processes which I'd like to see. The data are here, the processes are over here. If you think, oh, I only see data at a resolution of, I don't know, 100, 100 kilometers, but I'd like to make inference at resolutions of 10 kilometers, you can do it. It's, the data should not drive what you want to make inferences on or where you want to ask the questions. The data are imperfect, and they might be imperfect due to noise, and they might be imperfect due to missingness, and now they might be imperfect due to resolution. So I want to introduce the idea of moving through resolutions. Um, the uncertainty we're going to handle with probability theory. So, should we track every particle in the universe? I don't think so. Quantum theory allows us a certain form of randomization, but we can do a lot more in our uncertain world. And I'll put to you that randomness is in the eye of the beholder, but statistics is not. And I want to give you um, a, a mathematical example of this. This is a deterministic function. I know exactly where it is between 0 and 1. I simply have to evaluate it at s. s is my space. This is my function. Here is my location. This is my attribute. This is perfectly deterministic. I've chosen this function because I've got a lot of oscillation early and then much gentler oscillation later. And you'll see why uh, that could be important. It's called the Doppler function. So what I, all I did is, is aggregate this and stratify and fit a line to it. That's what we do in statistics, right? We look at data and we fit lines to them. This might be considered to be a trend. And so when I aggregate here and don't stratify, at k equals 3, I aggregate. I can fit a line to it, it's not bad. There's this little thing down here. Does that line come anywhere near what the Doppler function looks like? No. I can do a little better if I stratify, I might get closer to the Doppler function. If I, if I aggregate now at a scale of 5, or 2 to the minus 5, and create 5 strata, I can fit five straight lines. So what I'm trying to say to you is you might be looking at Doppler functions but you don't want to worry about it. You want to look, you want to let the data speak to you and your theories determine whether that Doppler function might be there or not. So the uncertainty in a sense is in the eye of the beholder. And I did something else, and I think you can see it on this wonderful big screen. I did, similarly, I did a form of aggregation and then put dots down. And I did it at a very, very fine resolution. And you can see here, it's very difficult to see what's random and what's not. And as I move through the aggregation, I start to see what's happening in terms of the structure. Um, these are different resolutions of what I've done. And you can see that. Underneath all of this is the Doppler function, and you could think of that as every particle being tracked in the universe, knowing exactly where it is, and yet it really doesn't matter at different aggregations. So this notion of scale is extremely important, and it has to do with the uncertainty as well as the missingness and as well as the measurement error that comes with your data. <clears throat> Okay, so um, I'd like to now get back to those six questions of geodesign and put it in the context of my area, which is statistical inference and design within statistics. 
So our goal is to climb the knowledge pyramid, which is from data to information to knowledge and to decisions. And geodesign is a ladder, and a very effective ladder that has been particularly uh, developed for what I call geography or urban planning type problems. But remember, our world is uncertain, and we're not going to get out of bed because of that. No, that's not true. We will get out of bed. We'll put probability theories on our uncertainty, and we will handle them as scientists would. There are other ways to deal with uncertainty, fuzzy logic, fuzzy sets, but it doesn't have the rule set and the consistency that probability theory does, and it does not have Bayes' rule. Bayes' rule is a way that you learn. Um, it's actually, you, could, you can, uh, and you can learn sequentially. You can update your knowledge using Bayes' rule. So there's a lot of attractive features. There's an investment made to be made for sure, because these probability distributions have to be constructed, but that's what we're trained to do in statistics. And, and a compelling way to capture all this uncertainty, and by the way, there's a lot of uncertainty. I've talked about you know, the data itself being uncertain because of noise. I've talked about the underlying processes as being uncertain because we don't know the geophysics, or because we don't have the right data at the right scale. Um, there's a lot of ways you can be uncertain. Even better, everything's related to everything else. So our, our carbon cycle determines our climate, and our climate determines actually our, our local conditions of living and whether we have a sustainable future or not, because we almost certainly in climate change and we know that we're going to have a, a, a drier world in the future and a hotter world in the future. We just we can just see that coming. That's the 1% and 10% that Jack talked about. But it starts with, with geophysics. It starts with what we're doing to our planet. And I'm all about, with my colleagues at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, of trying to understand that. All of these uncertainties put together, you might simply say, are overwhelming. But if you work through the conditional probability modeling paradigm, you're able to to, if you like, divide and conquer. Uh, the dividing is through conditional probabilities, being able to put together what the joint behaviour is, and the conquering is using the statistical modelling as well as the design and geo-design that I'm talking about. So let me just say um, fairly quickly that I think in statistics we do quite well in answering Carl's first two questions in the presence of uncertainty. We will construct those models that you're talking about. And in question three, here are the questions. Representation models, question one. Process models, question two. Evaluation models, question three. Questions four, five, and six, we don't do very well on at all. We have a theory. It's called decision theory. We can define the action space, we define a utility function, we make optimal decisions by maximising the posterior expected utility. And what I'd like to do is just sort of get you there in the next 10 minutes or so. So at the Gel Propulsion Laboratory, uh, we're looking at the global distribution of CO2 concentrations for very good reasons. As I mentioned, these are the sorts of things that lead into... Um, carbon cycle science that lead into climate science. And I'm going to give some compelling reasons why you would take our sphere, be very, very global in this case, right, and project it onto equal area grids. And we're going to use something called the ISEA grid, which I'm sure a number of you are familiar with. This slightly, uh, again, wonky slide is to make the case for when you're dealing with concentrations to deal with equal area grids. And it's what I call the law of the unconscious statistician. And it enables us not to worry about weighting and weighting optimally. Equal areas, concentrations, uh, the first slide establishes that if I want to have an aggregated concentration, it is equal to something that I'm sure you're all aware of called X bar. And I, I used X bar on purpose because any time you've done a STAT 101 class, somebody has asked you to compute X bar and its variance. 
And the idea of this slide is that most folks know that the variance of x bar is proportional to 1 over the number of observations. That's where that 1 over square root n comes from because we take the square root of the variance in order to come up with a standard error or a precision estimate. And it's pretty easy to see then that 1 over n is equal to this capital delta, which is fixed. It's a, because I have equal area divided by the area of the region. So I get for free, if I have equal areas, that the variance of the aggregated concentration is 1 over the area of the region. And when I'm dealing with equal areas, I get to deal with equal weights. So if I am interested in combining resolutions, I have information at resolution 6 and resolution, information at resolution 8, I make sure that I am in an equal area situation and I can combine them by going back to the basic area unit of equal area. Aggregation and disaggregation, certainly fundamental to climate science. People build climate models at half degree by half degree resolution, but they want to make inference at the 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer scales because that's where local governments decide where they're going to put dams or how they're going to mitigate what they see as an uncertain climate in the future or a warmer climate and a drier climate in the future. So when equal area projection is used, the law of the unconscious statistician is able to kick in. This represents um, the Earth and its icosahedron, its spherical icosahedron, and I just want to rotate that Earth to show you how the Earth is split up according to those icosahedra, which are of equal area. You can flatten that. Um, we do flatten it at JPL when we're doing our work, um, but we preserve the great circle distances. This is more for visualization than um, we do preserve the great circle distances. The um, equal area grid that we put on is a hexagonal grid and it has some rather nice properties. There are hexagons in there that are five-sixths the area that we do take into account. But you can see that um, icosahedron superimposed on these hexagons. Here on the Earth view, this represents a resolution 3. And the nice thing about these projections is that they do disaggregate 4, 5, and here on resolution 6, I've shown you output from our particular carbon dioxide model. And this is at resolution 6. Now, this is the Earth view. And in order to be able to handle the 2D features, I could show you that. But I don't like that because Australia gets tipped up on its side. And I kind of don't like that. I sort of feel like I'm, you probably think I'm falling off the cliff anyhow. But um, anyhow. The point is that we lose our sense of geography. So what I'm going to show you is what's called the cylindrical projection or the Mercator projection. It goes back a long way, but it is for us to orient ourselves. I want to point out that all the fine work that Tim Stow has done at JPL and that we're working with, and, and, and our inference and our change of resolution is working with, involves working on that spherical icosahedron and looking at distances based on that. So what I want to show you is uncertainty due to disaggregation. This is a very common problem, certainly in the climate area, and I'm sure you run into it too in geography, that you have theories or data at a particular aggregation but would like to know what's happening at a much finer scale. In this case, what I've chosen is an area here, which represents the middle of Australia. This happens to be West Wollongong, by the way. Uh, come down and see us, you all. And, and over here, I've chosen the same area off the coast of South America, and then a, an area in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, it's a very small area, by the way. It's a res 6 hexagon, uh, which is on the order of 100 kilometers on its side, um, near the Kiribati Islands. So what I'm trying to do is show you earth or land, ocean, um, aggregated resolution, fine resolution. Now you can see what I've done is actually some blocking. All right, land's different from ocean. Resolutions are different. So I've invoked some of Fisher's principles. The randomization that I'm going to use uses something called conditional simulation. 
and I'm going to be able to simulate what's happening at resolution 8 conditional on resolution 6. PCTM stands for Parameterized Chemistry Transport Model, which goes into those, figure, those pictures that I showed you earlier. And to do that, I'm going to use a spatial, statistical, hierarchical model, for which you are all experts now. I put up at least four slides, and I expect that as a, such a good expositor, you could do this too. We're going to repeat it a hundred times. I'm going to show you a picture of one, and then I'm going to show you the result of a hundred. So this is what you can do. The probability of it being at res 8 is equal to the probability of being at res 8 and res 6 because res 8 is obtained from res 6. There's no extra information on res 6. But now I use the laws of probability to write that as a product of what happens at res 8 given res 6. And that's where the uncertainty lies. And so what I'm going to do now is show you the results of disaggregating in the presence of uncertainty based on these randomizations. This particular slide shows you the temporal variability in the period of 2006 from January through December. These are monthly averages and here I've done what I would call the blocking which means block one is land and a single hex, block two is water and a single hex, that's the Kiribati, that's West Wollongong, Land, many hexes, represents um, that area of Australia and water, many hexes, represents that area off the coast of, the, of South America. I'm going to concentrate on January and I'm going to drill down on January and look at what happens within January, the first 15 days. And now I'm going to look at the fluxes. Often when you're dealing with time, it's important to take differences because what hits you immediately, if you like, is the big picture, but what you're interested in is in the residual behaviour. In particular for carbon dioxide, we're interested in the differences between the three-day averages from January 4 th uh, through 6 minus the three-day averages from January 1, 2, 3. And so I'm now going to drill down on those particular flux values. Um, it's part of the science, the carbon cycle science is driven by fluxes, that's partly why I'm doing it, but also I'm sure you'll find in your own analyses. And so what happens is, rather than looking at that very colourful map and looking at where the changes might be by looking at two maps side by side, I've taken a difference and I can see that Moscow in that particular time is extremely high in its production of carbon dioxide and somewhere in the Rhine Valley, to the east of the Rhine Valley, we have a sink. Uh, the source is the orange and brown, and we have sinks. And you can see the outline of various countries during that period. This represents the uncertainty, and in a sense, it's really where we're going with this inference design in the presence of uncertainty. You can see here the land pixel, which is West Wollongong, has a, has a negative flux. In other words, it's a sink in January, and that is in line with the sort of uptake of carbon dioxide, which happens due to strong growth in the, in the summer months in Australia. Um, the water pixel is essentially varying around zero, but the variability is slightly different from land to water. Um, you could imagine that in, when you're aggregating over many hexes, the variability goes down. And in fact, it goes down like 1 over square root of n. Remember that? Um, and it looks like this is set and settled on zero flux. They're neither sources or sinks over Australia and the ocean. That's understandable. There is variability within here. I'm just dealing with the resolution of plus or minus 0.5 parts per million. So I'm almost finished and I'd like to spend a little time on this slide in particular because this offers a way into the future for geodesign meets uncertainty. And I mentioned that statistics hasn't done a very good job of what I would call embracing the decision problem. Um, and in a sense we've climbed the pyramid from observations or data to information and to knowledge, because we pass on our uncertainty knowledge to the geophysicists, but we don't go that extra step. And this offers a way of going the extra step. 
The action space consists of all possible decisions. That's really part of the design. What, you know, I could choose this, I could choose this, this one's dumb, this one's really smart. But what does dumb and smart mean? In the decision theory literature, we have a notion of a utility function. This might be in terms of dollars or whatever numeraire that you care to put here. But for a particular action A1 and a particular series of processes Y, each of which have a probability associated with them, I'm able to compute the expected value of that utility. It's the expected value condition on what I know, namely conditional on the data. So what I'm dealing with here is very directly this hierarchical modeling that deals with the probability of Y given Z. And in effect, what it is from a decision point of view is I'm capturing risk. We know about risk. We have a strong feeling about risk, sort of a personal feeling about risk. But I'm capturing risk through that conditional probability Bayes rule, which is the probability of Y given Z. And I'm capturing the consequences of risk, the risk of a certain action. I'm capturing the consequences of that risk through these utility functions. And so I know that theory, but we haven't really applied it in the way that Carl applies it in his own uh, format of geodesign. And what I'd like to sort of put, and I will in a moment in my concluding slide, is that there is just a lot of wonderful work that could be done by linking this theory with the ideas that, we, that come out of the six basic questions of geodesign. We're very interested in our work in playing scenarios. And the scenario would be, you know, a country promises to reduce its carbon output by 10% in the year let's say 2015 or 2020. We can actually put that through the parameterized uh, chemistry transport model, the PCTM model, and see what the consequences are for atmospheric carbon dioxide. We can play policy scenarios with this type of thing. Policy is done at a, at a country scale, yet mitigation strategies have to be done at the local scale. So our uncertainty comes by going from large areas like China, for example, down to what the consequences of China's policy are on Redlands, California, for example. Redlands, California is a pixel at about res 11. We can find it on, the, on this particular map. So the scale is, is, is incredible with these types of systems models that we deal with and the uncertainties associated with them captured probabilistically, I can give you answers, but they're probability answers. They're not certainty answers. They're answers that say, here's my mean and here's my standard deviation. I have error bars for you. But I could go to Redlands, I can go to West Wollongong, and I can go to places of interest to you and your loved ones in order to do that. And I've actually done some of this work with climate models in the North America. The optimal decision is to use A1 in preference to A2 in this particular case. But what happens if U, for example, is not just one requirement, but many requirements? Sometimes I can optimize, A, A1 might optimize according to a particular U which a certain stakeholder has, but might not be very good according to other stakeholders. And these are the sorts of technical issues that I think statistics can solve. For my concluding slide, I would just like to say that geodesign and, and the work that has been done here and, and over the last 50 years is extremely compelling. When I read Carl Steinitz's book, I could see where, where all this was going from a, from a systems point of view, but where uncertainty might be incorporated. And, and I got very excited about it. I'm very pleased to be here to share this with you. And I want to point out that our world is uncertain, dot, 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 and all those things that go with it. But we have a technology based on conditional probabilities and hierarchical modeling, which will allow us to get there. Um, the questions that I believe we can get to fairly quickly are one, two, and three. We don't do well on that final ladder, that rung of the knowledge pyramid. 
where we get to make decisions, but we really need to. We have a great opportunity to, de to geo-design, which for me is a verb, Carl, that's a sort of an in-joke, um, in the presence of uncertainty, exclamation mark. Thank you very much.